Well, good morning, Neil. Good morning, and welcome to Antioch Christian Church. Time of week and sing praise to God and have some fellowship and hear some teaching about the Word of God. In the Word of God, we read that if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. We also have fellowship with God. And let's take some time to sing about, to start this out by singing about the fellowship with God. If you have a hymn book, you can pull it out. Hymn number 354, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, and the words will be on the screen. <laughs> What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, saved and secure from all alarm. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Some of you have been noticing on the news, we've got severe weather awareness week coming up this week. And I caught a little bit of a glimpse last night on the news and again this morning of where tornadoes have already went through the state of Iowa and people have lost their lives. So we just need to be get prepared for that. What I want to share with you, some of you have been to this. There's a presentation over at Northwest High School Wednesday at 6.30 called Storm Fury on the Plains. Our National Weather Service people in Wichita make this presentation. I have been several consecutive years. It's very, very good information. My brother can relate to this very well. He was going to Colorado out to our cabin and got out about as far as Joaquini, and he called me, and he was crying. I said, Paul, where are you at? He said, I don't even know where I'm at. His windshield was pushed back inside. It had splinters off of the inside of the glass of the back of the windshield, shooting splinters back at them in their face, their arms, clear back in the back part of the vehicle. Totally destroyed his vehicle by the hail. Later that day, we found out two to three miles ahead of him is where the tornado crossed the highway. Folks, you just are not going to outrun those tornadoes. So if you want to get some more weather information, see me after church, and I'll fill you in a lot more details of it. Thanks. Wednesday. 630 Northwest High School. And Linda Shepherd wants to speak on the women's ministry. Morning. Morning. We have our, our women's ministry meeting today at 1230, and all women are encouraged to attend. We're going to put together the bags for those that are homebound, and also we're going to eat. So come at 1230. Good morning. Most of you know back in the fall, 
um, Cindy Williams was the dean for the Prairie View Women's Retreat, and our church was the one who hosted that. When they came back, you know, in all of the hubbub and everything that happens and the exhaustion that you come down from, it got kind of misplaced that there were extra bags that did not get handed out because there were not 100 women that attended. So after church, at the back, there will be these little bags. If you are a lady that was not able to go to the retreat and you would like one with all the little goodies in it, please take one on your way home. I honestly, I didn't count them. I don't know how many are, are left, so I don't know if there's enough for everybody that's sitting in here, but if you want one, please grab one. Oh, we do, okay. Glad that you're with us today. Um, I do have another announcement also. March 14th um, at seven o'clock, we have a security and safety meeting here at the church. March 14th at seven o'clock. If you are on the security or safety um, crew, um, be here at Antioch at seven o'clock, March 14th. Um, I do want to mention also along with the Iowa tornadoes, the victims of the fires last night in Reno County and Harvey County, uh, there was quite a few people that lost their homes and uh, just keep them and their families in your prayers also. Um, keep Greg Stoddard in your prayers. He has a broken collarbone and continue prayers for Joe Coleman, also for um, his pneumonia. As with that, is there anything else that I'm missing? Okay, let us now go to the, our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this Lord's day to offer our worship, praise, and thanks for the honor of knowing you and your love. Your abundant blessings and love are beyond our knowledge, but you are presence within our hearts draws us close to you. Lord, we are reminded of the loving sacrifice, the loving sacrifice you made on the cross and the love and forgiveness you offer us this day. We pray that you watch over our nation and our world in these troubled times and provide a shield of protection to all those in harm's way. Comfort the families and friends of those who have sacrificed their lives for the freedoms they enjoy. Let us draw near to God as we worship him this morning. Seek his truth in the message from his word and share that love with those we meet in this coming week. Be with us as we continue our time of worship, Lord. In your precious name, amen. So, today we have Request Sunday. And so what I'd like for you to do is I'm going to be calling on different groups of people to uh, have their requests made. And so I'm going to start, well, let's start with this group here. Yes, sir. 350. And one more from your group. Yes, Katie. Katie. Number one. I'm going to even do it, since we don't have anybody sitting over here, I'm going to do one more. Uh, uh, <laughs> Cindy, there we go. 344. Okay, so 350. <laughs> Thank you. 
373. I, I, 473. 473. I wonder if that was going to be kind of, Yes, sir. Yes. 283. Another one from this group. You can think about it. I'll come back to you later. Okay. All right. Number 344. He's got the whole world in his hands. We'll do first and last. <laughs> Let's start again. Victory in Jesus. I wondered if that was going to happen. We'll do all three.
are God's people. I'm not familiar with this song, so we're going to sing verse 1 and 4. <laughs> What? 262. I'm coming over here. What do you guys got? <laughs> All right, I heard 239 and 237. 297. Wasn't it? And one more. Yes. Uh, Signora, what is What is it, Signora? 425. All right, and we'll use that as our communion hymn. Okay, 262. Holy, holy, holy. First and third. is coming again, first and last.
seven. I love to tell the story. Let's do all three, this one. I'm going to have a word of prayer before we do that. Father, I thank you so very much that you are with us today, that these songs stir up the heart of knowing that there is a God in heaven that does love us, that loves to spend time with us, if we would just slow down and get out there in that garden, wherever it may be, it might be in the desert land, who never, wherever it may be, oh God, we know that you're there. And that you will spend time with us and comfort us and strengthen us and encourage us. I pray today that you will do that in all of our hearts. That we might be able to come from this time of greeting and meeting our brothers and sisters in Christ to time of glorifying and honoring you who is our life. Strengthen us now and bless this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the garden, sing first and last.
time for communion we're clearing the stage but that's that's unusual but it's still time for communion and <clears throat> when our Lord taught us how to pray and this is in Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 he started out with these words our father you know it's pretty amazing when you think about that this mighty ruler who created the whole universe who governs it keeps it going and who will judge all of it is our Father. He could have made us his creatures or his objects, his things, or his slaves. But he made us his children. Now he's our Father in heaven, and that's important. In heaven, everything, every creature does what God wants. We have an example of that on earth. You know, for example, if God wants a volcano to erupt, it erupts. For we the people, it's not exactly like that. We have the ability to do what God does not want. And we've done that a lot. And it was for that reason that he sent his son to die for all those misdeeds so that whoever believed in him and obeyed his son would have life in heaven forever. Our father, just like any father, he wants a relationship with us. He doesn't want this because he's lonely. He's not lonely in heaven. There's everything there. He did it only because he loves us. And he wants to help us keep this relationship going. He gave us many things to help, many practices, many statements, many things he did to help us keep this relationship going. And communion is one of those. He gave that to us to help us remind, help remind us and help us remember what his son did for us. So let's get the communion packet peel off the, the top layer and unpack the bread. Let's play, let me pray for a minute. Father, when your son instituted this practice of communion that we're about to do now, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his apostles and he said, this bread is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we take this bread now, remembering that you loved us so much that you gave us your son, knowing that he would be killed to pay for our sins because you demanded a sacrifice for sin. So let's take the bread. Now let us open the juice container. pray. Father, your son took the cup after they had eaten, and he said, this cup that's poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So we take this cup showing you that we earnestly desire to be your children. We want to have this relationship with you, and we want to keep it going. So let's take the juice. pray. Father, this, this communion is uh, a very helpful gift, but it's, it's such a reminder of something so powerful, without which we could not look forward to being in heaven with you. We would be facing eternal death without you. And your love is so great, Lord, we just try to understand it. It's beyond our comprehension, but Lord, we desire it so, so much, so sincerely, so desperately we desire it. And we thank you for having a relationship with us. We pray these things in your son's name. 
Amen. I was very impressed by the song. Uh, uh, I love to tell the story because it reminded me of my mother. My mother loved that song. It made me think of all the people that all of us know that have gone on before. And they're up in heaven, and they're singing that song and many, many, many other praises to God um, all the time. And it, what a joy. And for anybody who is listening to this today who has not given their hearts and lives to Jesus, those of us who do know Jesus are going to be up there waiting for you. And we want you to know Jesus, and we want you to come and join us in heaven. And this is another song that kind of talks about that. So um, I'd like to sing this song that goes with John's sermon today. <clears throat>
Jesus broke the chains that kept me in chains, enslaved to sin, and set me free. Amazing what God has done. It's amazing what he has accomplished. And we get the opportunity to praise God for that, glorify him who is our life, and strengthen us in the glory that God has given to us. The verse that we have today, I choose it in order that it might be an encouragement to you. That it will set your hearts in a new way. That it might open up the ideas of what God has really intended for you when he saved you. And in that song, it said, I was a foreign, in a foreign land, and God set me free. But then it says, I'm still in that foreign land. And there's going to come a day when I'm going to be free from that too. But what am I right now in this foreign land that we are? We're strangers in this strange land. Where, what do we do? What are we going to be? What has God promised to us in the midst of all of this? When is it going to be? And so this verse, I think, is one of those verses that will help us immensely. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And though through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. This is a promise that God has given to Israel. But because we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, we will see that it belongs to us as well. Let's go to prayer. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to just be, well, not really study it, allow it to get into our bones, that we might be able to see that you are working a miracle even as we speak, and that your promises are valid no matter what our experiences are, that you have promised certain things to us that we can be able to certainly see them come to fruition. Doesn't matter what this world says, doesn't matter what this world does, doesn't matter what they do to us. We have the promise of God, and these are our promises. Thank you, O oh God. Give us insight today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the message is entitled, When the Waters Rise. It could have been, fire, fire, fire. It doesn't make any difference. There's all sorts of different things here. We got the waters rising. We got the fire going on. And what do we got? We got us coming through on the other side untouched, unchanged. God is going to do amazing things. So, we live in a world of fear, do we not? There's all sorts of things that can cause us to fear. You know, they, we live these perilous times that we have here. We don't know what's going to happen next. Who would have thought that Ukraine would be in war at this point in time? Remember 9-11? Remember what happened there? These just two buildings come crashing down at the action of some crazy people. And all of a sudden, people feared. Feared so much that the church is almost filled up with people the next Sunday. You did here. We had lots of people. I had never seen, hadn't seen some of them at, in this church at all, ever. But some of them I had seen, they were feared. They wanted to get close to God, and that's a good thing that they wanted to get close to God. They wanted to get closer to that which they knew that was the security that they had to fight this fear that they had. Now we have this war in Europe that's going on, and we got a guy out there that, that he's uh, seeking to devour a neighboring country that did not have any designs on their territory whatsoever. In fact, gave part of their territory to them without a fight, hardly. And, then he's, and he's, <clears throat> he's saying, if you guys oppose me, I'll destroy you as a nation. If you oppose me, world, I'll blow you up with my atomic weapons. And that can cause a lot of fear, can it not? So in what in the world? What is there to fear in this world? Everything is here. We have those who would do call good evil and that which is evil good. That's here at home. We've got some things going on right here, right now, that's taking place in our world that is saying, if you, if you, don't say the right things to people. If you don't use the right pronoun, you're fired. You're going to offend somebody if you do that. 
and we can't have you offending these people, so therefore you're gone. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter that they're offending you, but you, you, you've got, because what you think is right and is good, that there is, go to the scriptures. How many genders are there in the scriptures? God created man and female. Male and female created he them. There's only two genders, and that's what we know as truth. That is the truth of the scriptures, that that is all there is. There may be, there's some other issues that are involved with that, but that is what is. And yet, what has happened is that the new truth, the new good, is that we have to cater to those who do not see the truth. And that's just one little tiny issue that is out there. And it's getting more and more and more there that if you start preaching the gospel, you are, you're not acceptable. You're going to offend somebody. Oh, we can put their stuff out there, but you can't put your stuff out there because it's truth. And they do not want the truth. And so we live in a very fearful world that you, as, as you try to live your life as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and openly and completely as you can, and you're being shut down by our culture around us. And it's going to get worse. We know it is going to get worse. It's going to come our direction. And we're, we're going to have to make a decision. That can't, there's a school right here in town where a teacher was told that he, you know, he, he tried to accommodate as best he can, but he just couldn't get himself to call a young lady that thought she was a male. And he couldn't call her by that pronoun. And the te they, they were told, you'd lose a job right here and right now if you don't do it. So he submitted to that. Going against his own conscience, own what he understands of the scripture, he is forced to do that which is contrary to what he thinks. And you think, it's somewhere else? It's, oh, it's just California that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I came from that country. I know there's a bunch of fruits and nuts out there. And it, it, it is crazy, but it's here now. And the places that we have, we've got to do something about it. And the thing that we do about it is we do not fear. That's what we first have got to do. Where are all those people that came into church for 9-11? They came in. I hope some of them stayed. I hope some of them developed a relationship with God so they do not fear. But they... The danger went away. The immediate danger went away, and they went away. And they're no longer walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're no longer interested in coming to church anymore. They may say we ought to, but they don't do it. Why? Because it's not convenient. It's not what, it, what they want to do in their life. And yet, here you are. What are you doing here? Because you love the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? Do you not? Is it, is it burning on your heart that you want to stay with God no matter what? One of the benefits of this is that you do not have to fear. You don't have to fear. Once you have a relationship with the living God, there is no fear there. Oh, there may be things that happen to us, but it's not need to be fearful. It says in Isaiah 43, 1, it says this. This is the first verse that we have here. The second verse is one is our verse. But this verse here says this. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who is your creator, Jacob, and he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. So we sing that song. I have been redeemed. Redeemed. But by God, the one who created me, the mighty one who loved me from the foundation of the world. This is the one who belong, I belong to, and I do not need to fear. Though the towers come crashing around me, though the fires rise up around me, though the waters rise over my head, I do not need to fear, for my God is with me. Our Creator is there. <clears throat> we know that Jesus is the means by which God created the universe. Amazing thing. This is in Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth. 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. You remember that verse? We love that verse. All things work together for, according to him who loves us. It didn't say it right, but you all know it. All things work together for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. That's the verse I wanted. That is a verse that is built on the fact that everything was being created by God, even the darkest, 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 darkest creatures of the universe. They've been created for God, and they are subservient to him, and they subserve his will. And you go, that is crazy. Yes, it is crazy as far as humans are concerned, but God is still God. He is the creator of the universe. There is nothing that happens without his permission. There is nothing that happens without his say-so. He is sovereign God, all God mighty, almighty God who does care for us. He is working a miracle in our lives. He is transforming us into the image of his son. He is doing that work in us now. And to do it the way he wants to do it is so that we can live forever. That's his goal. Let us make man in our own image. What we're going through, and if it may be fire, it may be water, it may be storms, it may be wars, is a way that God uses in us to make us what he wants us to be. So therefore, do not fear. There's a book. It's a secular book. And it says, fear is the mind killer. And it is. People that get afraid, they do stupid things. <clears throat> when uh, Charles Spurgeon, he, got a, he had to preach to thousands of people. He got to the place where 10,000 people were coming to listen to him preach on a Sunday morning. This is back in the 1800s. So there was no church that he could go to to do that. So he had to go to a secular situation. In 1856, while he was there, a situation occurred. He's preaching away, and somebody, some idiot, <laughs> I'm sorry, but somebody that was very stupid, got up and yelled, fire, fire, fire. No fire. There's no smoke. He said, the, the, the banister, balusters are falling. Fire, fire. Got it. The people, 10,000 people, got up at once and tried to leave at the same time. Not possible. They came in one at a time. You can't get all 10,000 out through the doors. Seven people died as a result of that. Nearly destroyed Charles Spurgeon's ministry because he blamed himself for that. He tried to stop them to slow down, but they wouldn't listen to him. They got this fire in their head, and out they go. Got huge criticism in the newspapers, everything else. Could have destroyed him. But God is still God. God knew that was going to happen. God knew that. He is still God at the end of the day. He knew the towers were going to fall, and he knew the people were going to respond and come and to go away again. He knew all of that. But what are we going to do about it? Do we fear? And the answer is no. Do not fear. It is our creator who does this. He says for us to not to fear. In Isaiah 41.10, he says this, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. I am your God. Do not fear. Oh, the nation is attacked from outside. It's being destroyed from the inside. Oh, there's this. Oh, there's that. Do not fear. Rise yourself up to the place of knowing that my God is with me. That does not mean sit on your hands and say, God, I'll take care of it. You will see that what we do is that we do go through the water and we do go through the fire. But we do not fear the water, nor do we fear the fire. It's amazing. How is it possible? First of all, we are chosen of God. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you are chosen by him. It's a beautiful picture that God gives to us. 
that you are not there by your choice. You are there by his choice. Do you understand that? God chooses you. Oh, but God, I'm such a, such a sinner. I'm so lost. I'm so dark. I'm so, you can't love me. There's no way that you can love me. Look what I've done with my life. I've, I've come to them toward the end of my life, and, it, and I'm, I'm, I'm devastated because of all the stupid stuff that I did, and I was so selfish, and I hurt people, and I damaged people. And God says, I love you. I went to a cross to carry all of your shame, all of your sin. I took the full wrath of God against myself, against myself. I took it all upon me because I love you. I choose you. Oh, that the heart of men would open up to the gospel of grace and mercy, that they might understand that there is a God in heaven that really did come to walk upon the face of this earth 2,000 years ago, that really did take their sins upon himself, that really did take the full wrath of God upon himself, who was buried, who was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and has ascended into heaven and is coming back again to retake this whole thing to the completion. We're chosen by God. But we should <clears throat> always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved of the Lord, because, whoops, here, come on, here you go. Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. This is the Thessalonians he's talking about here. I, we, we give praise to God for you because God has chosen you. From when? From the beginning. That is mind-boggling. <laughs> I keep telling you, there's a guy that came to me one time, he says, I've looked at your life and I decided if you could become a Christian, anybody can become a Christian. I, I love that. I love that. My only claim to fame is that I became a Christian. That's all I care. That's my claim to fame. That's the claim of the most amazing thing. And if I can be an example to others, that they too can open their heart to this God who changes hearts and minds and souls, then hallelujah. That's all I want, is for you to know Jesus and not fear, ever fear again. If chosen, then what? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, for his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. This is out of Peter. Everything pertaining to life and godliness God has granted you. If you're a chosen one of his, you've been given everything that God has, every blessing that he wants to pour out. Every promise of God is yours in Christ Jesus because you are chosen of his. Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, through these he has granted to us the precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world on account of lust. You're set free. The chains have fallen off. You have been set free, and you're set free to glory. You're set free to this place of taking, partaking of the divine nature. We will be like him. As he is, so also shall we be. By his choice, by his doing, by his work in our lives. Is not this amazing? Is that not amazing? Do you not glory in that? Do you not understand? God loves me. Glory be to his holy name. What am I doing fearing? What am I doing casting dispersions upon my brothers and sisters in Christ? What am I doing that for? I am, and they are, the chosen of God, the holy ones of Israel. Let us be those who are without fear and without doubt that there is a God in heaven that does do what he says he's going to do. So what is that promise that he has given to us? And now we come to our verse for today. It says, when you pass through the waters... I will be with you. 
and though through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the faint flame burn you. This is a promise to you. This is a promise to you. What does it mean? Well, what it's not promised here, it's not promised a bed of roses with no thorns. Here you are. Here's a bed of roses with no thorns. Just, you know, lounge your eyes. When you leave Jesus, you just, just drift through the rest of your life and just wonderful, just nice smells and nice rosy things around you. No thorns, just nothing at all. No, that is not the promise that God gives to us. In fact, Paul says all who wish to live godly will be persecuted. We'll guarantee you that you will have thorns. You may have some roses along the way, but you'll have those thorns. It's amazing. You will pass through the waters. It says that, doesn't it? When you pass through the waters, you will pass through waters. There will be difficulties. There will be damage. There will be people that hurt you and damage you. There will be things that hurt you and damage you. There will be storms that will hurt and damage you. There will be all sorts of things. There will be wars and rumors. There's all sorts of stuff out in this world that is not right and is not submissive to God, and yet it is submissive to God because God takes it and uses it in our lives to make us into the image of his son, Jesus. And it says that you will walk through the fire. You will walk through the fire. You will. But what is it promised when those things happen to you? Number one, when you walk with your God, he takes you through those hard times. He will take you. They may take your life. Do you realize that? That which I am going through may take my life, but I do not fear. Why? Because Jesus said very clearly that you who believe in me will never die. It will take my physical life, but it will never die. And though the fire, you will not be scorched. You remember the, the, the picture of those, those guys that have all these coals and they walk across the coals and they'll get on the other side? I'm not going to do that. But in real life, you do that. And what it says is when you get on the other side, it's going to be okay. You got double insurance from God. Number one is Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego is our example of this. You don't remember what they did. They were saved from the flames, were they not? There they are. They're Taken up to the fiery furnace. The fiery furnace was heated up seven times greater than normal. The guys that took them up to throw them in, they died. It was so hot, it killed them. But these guys, they threw them in the furnace, and there they are. They should have been burned up instantly. But they were standing around, talking to another individual that wasn't. Didn't say what happened to the fourth one, but the three guys got them out. And not only that, they they were saved from the flames. That's the one insurance that God will us there. Not even the hair on their head or the smell of fire was upon them. The double insurance is they're not any worse off. Not a bit worse off. Zero bad off. They are through the fire and they come out and they don't have their cords that they were bound with. It's been burned off without any mark upon them. And so I was almost guaranteed that the flames and the smoke would come to me. And I always smelled like smoke whenever the fire was all done. They didn't smell like smoke at all. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> this, this guy, this Charles Spurgeon says this. So the text seems to me to teach that the Christian church, under all of its trials, has not been consumed. But more than that, it has not lost anything by its trials. The Lord's church has never been destroyed, yet by her persecutors and by her trials, they have, brought, they have thought they crushed her, they, but she still lives. They had imagined that they had it has always resulted in growth of the church. The only time that the church ever recedes is whenever the church gains power. 
And when the church gains power, either governmental power or ecclesiastical power, they become corrupt. But if we just stay the church, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, to build up and stay focused on what we're here for, we're not here to change governments. We're here to change the hearts of men. And hopefully we'll change the hearts of the people in government so they can do what is right. That is good, but it is not to change government. That is not our job. Our job is to change hearts. And that's who we are. We're the changer of the hearts. If we stay focused on that, then no matter what the enemy does to us, we will grow and grow. If you take a man and destroy him, put him into fire, burn him up, there will be ten more the next day that will say, do that to me too because I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe. You name a, a, give a dog a bad name and you hang him. But you give a Christian a bad name, you honor him. It's amazing. Like the Quakers, for example. The Quakers were simple. They believed in God. They were shake. And so people called them Quakers as a der derisive word. But they instead took that thing and they made it, made it their name. We are the Quakers. Hallelujah. They turn it into a positive and do, thus doing away with the negative. The Methodists are the same thing. When they were, they were doing the walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and they were doing it well and they were going out forth and telling people about Jesus, they, were, they had a method about what they were doing. And so those silly Methodists, I did a little story the other day uh, a few weeks ago about a guy says, I, everywhere I go there's a Methodist. What am I supposed to do with all these Methodists? And it was derisive. But they took their name, and now you have the United Church of Methodists, whatever it is, and now they are not doing what they ought to be doing. They are not following after God closely. They are not holding tightly to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're denying lots of things, and they're buying into a lot of stuff that is not right. Well, let's not arrest these people who are robbing the stores. And let's go, well, at least not until they get past $900. You know, let, let them go ahead and do that. And, and we'll just let them go. And we won't, we won't hold them accountable to that because that's the new good. I mean, we're, we're writing justice right now. We're, we're fixing things. Are we fixing things? Are we destroying things? Destroying the very fabric of our lives? Yes, we have a message to bring to this world, and the world does not want to hear it. But we must be faithful. Christian. The first time that the word Christian was used was in Antioch. Not this Antioch, the one in the, the Middle East. And there they were called Christians. They were not called Christians because of honoring them as Christ ones, but rather those nasty Christians, they're always in our face about believing in God and that God loves me, and all that sort of stuff. We don't want to hear that because we want to stay with our Dianas. We want to stay with our Zeus. We want to stay with our demons. We'd rather die in that rather than accept the fact that there's a God that really does love us and do does cause us to want to be obedient to him. Yes, you do have to give up that. But nevertheless, we can't have that. We'll just go to death. We'll go to hell because of that. What in the world? Let us proclaim Jesus to this world and keep consistently proclaiming. They're going to do what they're going to do, but we must do what we must do. So beware ch churches who gain power because when churches gain power, they become corrupt and they get into buying into the world system because the world system says, you have to do it this way or else you lose your job. And so the person says, well, I've got to keep my job, so therefore I'll do, go your way. And there's many individuals who change their theology very quickly when the tides of society change. They'll change the way they think. They'll change the way that they believe. Do not do that. You have the word of God. It is clear. It is concise. <laughs> it's just a little book, really. It's amazing what it has in it. It's got powering in it. <laughs> Something in there that makes the words more powerful. I don't know what, what, how God does that. But I, I went into a library when I was a new Christian. It was uh, at the Long Beach State College. The second floor of this brand new college that's eight stories high, one whole floor were books written about this one book. 
in a secular school, in a secular school, there are books written about this one book. All those books written about this one book that I can hold in my hand. Isn't that amazing? It has power. Don't fall for the foolishness of this world. For he is our Savior. It says in verse 3 of 43, it says this, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba as an exchange for you. You are precious. You are precious to God. You are called by him and you are precious. Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored I and I love you, I give you other people in your place and other nation in exchange for your life. I love you. I care for you. He is our Savior. Do not fear, for I am with you. I'll bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar. I will make it so that you do not lose a single thing when the enemy comes and sets your feet on fire and set your, flood you with water, and whatever it may be, when you get on the other side, you'll have everything that God intends for you to have, and you will have it well. You will not lose anything in following Jesus. It says this, Upon the entire church, at the last, there shall not even be the smell of fire. I see her come out of the furnace. I see her advance up the hill towards the final glory with her Lord and Master. And the angels look at their garments, and they are not tattered. Nay, the fangs of her enemies have not even been able to make a single rent in therein. They draw near to her. They look upon her flowing ringlets, and they are not, are, <coughs> and they are not crisp with heat. They look upon her very feet. And though she has trodden the coals, they are not blistered. And her eyes have not been dried up by the fierceness of the seven times heated flame. You will not lose anything. You will not lose your life. You will not lose your fortune. For if you're building that which is in glory, you will have it when you get there. It is a glorious calling that God has given to us. Amazing. She has been made more beautiful, more fair, more glorious by the fires, but hurt she has not been, nor can she be. You can not be hurt. Your body may be destroyed, and it'd be painful to go through that. And we've, I've been through many of individuals who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who have gone through much pain. Much pain. I'm told you the story in one of the letters, letters I wrote in the, in the newsletter about a man named James. I'll never forget that. He'd been suffering for months. And toward the end, he was suffering greatly. And the day I went in, and one day I went into him and he said, the Lord told me, just one more day. One more day. I don't know why he had to go one more day. I did not understand that. But the next morning, I went to the, to the, uh, <clears throat> the hospital early because I knew he was going home that day. And while I was in the hospital, he went home. He went to glory. He did not lose a thing. And in fact, what he did is because of that, he left a testimony behind that God knows the day and the hour of our leaving this world. And he is not messing around. You come home to be with me, you've lost nothing in the journey, but you've only gained. You will not be overwhelmed by the waters. You will not be scorched or damaged by the fire. You will not smell and smell like fire when you get done, for you'll be in the presence of God, gloriously, wonderfully saved. Whomsoever, everyone, who is called by my name. Everyone who is called by name. Who is that everyone? 
Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, this is for you. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I... You say, I don't believe, I don't, I don't deserve this. No, you don't deserve it. If there's nothing about you. It's not about you deserving or not deserving. It's about his great love that he has for you. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, then this is yours. You can't sleep through it, guys and gals. You can't go through this life and say, oh, I'm saved, I'm going to be glory, that is wonderful. You're, you're going to go through the fire, you're going to go through the floods, you're going to go through all of life, and you're going to need him every step of the way. But he's going to be with you every step of the way. Whosoever, everyone who's called by his name, you will be his. He says, turn then to the individual Christian and remember that the promise stands alike firm and fast with each believer. Christian, if you, are if you be truly a child of God, your trials cannot destroy you. And what is better still, you can lose nothing by them. You may seem to lose for today, but when you, the account comes to be settled, you shall not be found to be a farthing the loser, but all the temptations of the world and all the attacks of Satan which you have endured, nay, more, you shall be wondrously the gainer. Your trials, having worked patience and experience, shall make you rich. Your temptations have taught you your weakness and shown you where your strength lies. Shall make you strong. You are strong. Because why? Because I, because you, because we are believers in the Jesus Christ who died on the cross, taking all of our sins upon himself, taking the full wrath of God against it, and died for us was buried, but on the third day rose again from the dead for our justification. Hallelujah. We have the promises of God. And he and he alone is our God. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed and there will be none after me. I, only I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. That is our God, and that is your promise. That is your promise. You shall not lose anything as you handle the life that God gives to you and the fire that comes. We do not know. We've been very fortunate in this country for the last 50, 100 years. No one's been attacking the Christian church until, well, they really haven't started attacking the church yet. But we may come to that time. Because we cannot help but to say the word of God is true. I have lots of compassion for individuals who have a difficulty with their identity. We all had identity problems when we were growing up. But what they're doing is they're destroying children's lives who would struggle through that and come on the other side and know who they are. Now they're messing with their, their whole being and messing with their identity, and it's going to be horrible for that child to come back out of that into sanity. But we must be able to stand firm and hold that this is the Word of God. And it is true. It is true. There's lots more to what I have to say, and I wish I could say it, but I don't have enough time. But we must have compassion on those who are messed up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> maybe that's not the right wording to use. And maybe it's insensitive. I don't know. But I know that people are messed up. I was messed up. I got messed up horribly. And I was about ready to lose my mind. And God came into me. And he changed me. And he's able to do that to every single person out there. Don't ever forget that. They may even hold to a position that is completely contrary to you, but you stay fast, firm with God, but also stay fast and firm in loving that person. Helping them see there is a God in heaven who loves them. 
Let's pray. Father, I thank you so very much for your power and your word and the strength and encouragement that you give to us through this word. Strengthen us now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be individuals who are able to understand that the fire comes, the waters rise, but you're still our God, and we have no fear. We know where we're going. We know that you're taking us exactly the way you want us to go, and we trust you. Don't know what's going to happen. Life can change just quickly and everything go back to the way it was 50 years ago. Who knows? But I have a sneaking suspicion that that's not going to happen. That the cat's out of the bag. That the, those who wish to destroy the very fabric of your creation have tasted a little blood and they're going to go for more. But we must stand firm. Even if they taste our blood, we must stand firm with you, loving them, preaching the gospel, expecting you to work a miracle in their lives too, that they may repent and not go to death. But we still need to stand. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing another song. Uh, revive us again. Sing. First two verses.
Boy, what a glorious day. Glorious day. Yes, amen. While they're preparing for, uh, for baptism, let's, uh, let me just talk about something that happened on the day of Pentecost. That was when the disciples were gathered and the Holy Spirit came with tongues of fire. They started speaking in foreign languages. They weren't babbling or just mumbling stuff. They were speaking languages like the language from Libya, the language from Ethiopia, not languages that, were, that they'd ever spoken before. And uh, people outside heard this and they said, oh, they're all drunk. Well, they weren't. They weren't drunk. So Peter went to explain this to them. And he said quite a bit, but he ended up by saying this. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter told them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And that's what Gail did. She repented of her sins and she will be baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and committed her life to him. And Peter knew about this promise that the Lord had given him and he told them, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call, and that includes us. Thank you, Lord, for this commitment by by Gail, and thank you for revealing yourself to her. And uh, we always pray that you'll open the hearts of people to receive you as their Savior. And Lord, you've answered this prayer for Gail. And I thank you for that. And we just wait with joy for her commitment to you, her public commitment to you by being immersed in the waters of baptism. Pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Thank you. 